Thank you everyone for joining us today and attending our webinar on Airbnb arbitrage. Uh, so this is a, a topic that's really explored in popularity. There's been a lot of demand for information by new entrepreneurs uh, that want to get started in this field. And it's been really nice for on, on our end to see this new influx of new entrepreneurs that are looking at vacation rentals as an investment opportunity. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing more on uh, the foundations and how to do your due diligence before you get started in the arbitrage business. Uh, so if there's any experienced vacation rental managers in the crowd, definitely there's going to be some good information for you still because an arbitrage property could be a good uh, diversification to your portfolio. So I think the information is still going to be valid for you, but uh, some parts, are, of course, you already cover in your day-to-day -day operations. But uh, overall, uh, this is going to help new entrepreneurs and anyone getting set up in this in this business type or business model, uh, a solid foundation on how to do their research and getting ready for this. So I'm just going to present real quick uh, our panelists. So today, uh, well, first of all, I'm Fred Vasily. I'm the marketing manager at Hostfully. Uh, for those of you who don't know Hostfully, we offer two products. So Property Management Platform, which is a central hub for operations for your vacation rentals uh, management and uh, offers things like distribution on Airbnb and VRBO. And then you can coordinate all sorts of tasks with your team as, a, as your business is going to grow. Um, and I think we can go from uh, left to right. So Ryan, if you could start by introducing yourself, please. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Saylor, and I'm the head of partnerships here at Beyond. Um, I've been with Beyond for the past couple of years now. I started on our revenue management and product team, and I'm excited to um, talk about our content today. Looking forward to it. Perfect. And that means I'm up next. Uh, I'm Peter Andrew Skevich. I usually just go by Peter A to keep it easy. Um, been at Breezeway for about two years now. I run business development here. Um, but not new to the vacation rental industry. I joined after uh, about five years running connectivity and as a market manager at Airbnb. Uh, super excited to share some of the knowledge I've learned over the years and uh, hope to connect with some of you guys after the show as well. And hi guys, my name is Taylor. I'm the director of business development with Key Data Dashboard, working with property managers. Uh, previous to working with Key Data, I was in property management myself in Panama City Beach, Florida. So really excited to be here today and presenting with everyone. I've been with Key Data now for three years, so um, it's been a great um, a great time. And obviously, data is is becoming my favorite thing, which can be boring at times, but we just love it so much. So excited to be here today to share some information. Oh, don't say that. We all love data in this industry. <laughs> I say that we make it fun. It's really an interesting thing, like the amount of people that get so excited about it at the time, but beforehand, you know, how many people were actually talking about numbers constantly as much as they do now in these charts. So we love it. <laughs> well, that's great. So we're just going to start with a quick 30,000 over foot overview of Airbnb arbitrage. So Essentially, if you're in this webinar, you've probably read about it or seen it on, on social media or even uh, been in other webinars where, you know, it's the concept of you sign a long term rental like a lease and then um, you turn around and you lease that property on vacation rental platforms or you operate as a vacation rental property. And then basically the expense of your lease versus the income you make, uh, that's the that's your revenue for your business. So uh, in theory, it's very simple. You just go out and you rent apartments and you list them on vacation rental platforms and you start your vacation rental business that way. As we'll see though, um, there's a tendency, at least from our perspective, to make things a little simple with this model or portray it to be. But in reality, uh, when it comes to the due diligence, that's what's going to make or break your business. And we have some really good panelists that are gonna talk about that. But uh, it's important to remember that a vacation rental business is an active business and there's going to be a lot of involvement. So, uh, again, just to dispel a little bit the passive income aspect of Airbnb arbitrage. That said, very low barrier to rent entry. Essentially, because you're only signing a lease, you're not putting any upfront capital, like if you were to purchase a real estate asset. So uh, that down payment that you would have to, 
to, to put for that property, you can use for the decor and all that. So I suppose when you just rent the property, all you have to do is decorate it and furnish it versus the traditional model of buying and then renting on vacation rentals. You have to do both the down payment and the, uh, the furnishings. And then there's also less risk. So if after a couple of months, uh, it doesn't work out, you can just, you know, sell everything on Facebook marketplace and cancel your lease if it's flexible that way, or just wait it out till the end of the year and then uh, leave versus if you're, if you purchase properties, uh, then you're, you know, you have that whole mortgage and the exiting a real estate purchase can be a little complicated sometimes. For those that are new in the industry, uh, it's a great segue into the vacation rental management business or hospitality. Uh, and I say that because if you are interested in starting in vacation rental management, the typical pathway is usually you start with one property, then, you know, you have someone else that you know, and you're going to manage it for them. And it's sort of like a snowball effect. But if you don't have that expertise or that, that experience in the industry, it might be difficult for you to sign up second homeowners who want to make money with uh, their, with their property. So it's a good segue uh, to get in because if you say, well, I'm, now I manage five or 10 Airbnb arbitrage properties, I can also you know, manage your second home for you. So it's a great way to do it. Um, lots of questions with regards to the legality uh, that we're getting for Airbnb arbitrage. And for the most part, it is legal to, to do this. However, you are subject to the local laws and regulations. So some communities outright don't allow short-term rentals um and then you have to also be careful when you get started in this model that uh the lease you're going to sign allows you to to do airbnb arbitrage um so the last thing you want is to get involved in something and you're not allowed to do it and of course um negotiate with the landlord before you start uh, in the airbnb arbitrage business it's very important um especially in communities where, or in local localities where you have to sign uh, a, uh, like where they have these ironclad leases, you might get caught if you're not careful with the contract that you sign. So that's the due diligence that you need to do. It's like a very quick overview of the due, due, due diligence you need to do to start an Airbnb arbitrage business. Um, so that's the quick one. Now, we're going to get a nice presentation on the market research and how to make sure that before you even sign a lease, uh, your business has a potential to be profitable. So Taylor, off to you. Okay. All right. So yes, we, we definitely want to make sure that we're protecting our invest investment with good data. And so we want to go over two really important factors, and that would be the revenue that you're going to generate from this property, plus the, you know, subtracting out those expenses. So, you know, revenue is going to come from the rental costs that you have, any additional fees or any kind of add-ons that you add into your um, home, it, rather you're adding additional features, things like that. And then with the expenses being, of course, your lease fee, your rent that you have, um, cleaning fees, you know, you're paying suppliers to go in, staffing for cleaning, decor, like he was mentioning, this may not require as much in-depth de decor for a house that you purchase, but you do still want to like make it unique as your rental. And so how are all of those expenses coming out to give you the profit for the home itself? So we have some top KPIs for understanding rental performance, and they are your paid occupancy rate. So this is the percentage of nights booked by your guest, the average daily rate, so the average rent paid per guest night, and then you have annual revenue, which is gonna come from ADR and occupancy. And sometimes RevPAR is talked about a lot, and this is really great for understanding rates and not so much when it comes to looking at your investments. So when you hear those terms come out, just kind of keep that in mind. One example that I could give you is that a market's annual occupancy rate, let's say, is 65%, and then the market's average daily rate is $200. So my total annual revenue is going to come out to that $47,450. So those KPIs for a type of, or for a type of unit in a specific market, such as for a two-bedroom, nicely furnished apartment in Miami, that'll help you determine where the arbitrage, arbitrage is a good investment. So in the example, the total of your expenses would have to be considerably less than that 47 or 50 uh, for this to make financial, financial sense, right? And so that's where you start to use, uh, use data to identify the best markets for arbitrage. So just now we're looking at revenue and what this report is showing is annual short-term short rental revenue for one bedroom properties by Florida counties 
for 2021 data. And we do know that 2021 was a very exceptional year when it came to vacation rentals. Um, and so this is looking at that, that rental revenue for those. This is every county in Florida. So I kind of just pulled out some of the key counties um, to highlight here. So Monroe County bringing in a very large amount of revenue, Nassau County, Okeechobee, and Polk County as well. And so you're able to identify where the most profitable or at least re rental revenue comes out of these counties. And then the next thing you wanna make sure you're checking in addition to the revenue is the expenses. And so each county also has a significant amount of expenses. Monroe County bringing in the most revenue also is bringing in the most expenses here we can see. And so that's how it's going to help you identify, like, is that even going to be worth it, right? So you're going to have to take both of these two points and then put them into another chart we can provide um, to help you see, like, how those are kind of looking over each other. And all in all, Monroe still has the most profit. Even with those high expenses there, it just made so much in revenue that overall the profit's really good. Uh, Franklin County also being a really big one. I live in this in the Florida Panhandle and I do see a lot of opportunity when it comes to investments in Franklin County that are always missed because they're not Panama City Beach and it's not Destin. Um, so definitely a great area that you could see like the expenses are going to be less because rent is cheaper there. Um, it's easier to find staffing maybe. Things like that are going to be in the, you know, definitely things you're considering there. So here are some of my important considerations. So finding the data. So you want to find the data. It's not always straightforward, right? It's not, it's not clear as day. Here's where you need to go. This is what you need. You really have to make sure you're putting in the work to really identify that and put those expenses in. So key data does have property performance data to help you understand potential income. So the key data platform can help with that. There's also data sources for long-term rentals. So Zillow and RealPage, Mego, and there's others too. You want to make sure that you are accounting for changes in seasonality. In most markets, occupancy and ADR fluctuate dramatically by season. Your long-term rent will not, right? That's going to stay the same, so there's going to be different things in, to consider there. Uh, while long-term rent may be your biggest expense, it's not going to be the only one. So be conservative and overestimate your expenses. Like Even if you're renting, there may be other things you still are going to have to consider, like if things happen to the rental, right? There, there may be things that kind of depending on the regulations in your county that you're you're still responsible for, right? Uh, then you have your owner cleaning and maintenance holds. Those will cut, cut into your potential revenues to so be sure to account for those non-revenue generating nights too. Whether things happen to the property or you need to do a deep clean on it, or if you're like, well, I'm going to stay there too. Like that's, that's great, but you need to make sure you're accounting for that in your revenue. If you are a property in New Orleans and you're like, I'm going to be there the month of February. Cool. Well, you might be missing out on revenues to so make sure you account for that too. And that's what I've got. So um, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, Taylor. And yeah, it can be understressed the, the importance of, in this case, buying data or finding data with tools like key data. Um, and that's really going to help you estimate your, your revenue potential. So uh, big shout out to our data partners. Uh, and the service they provide because it takes away the, the guessing game uh, when you're trying to forecast your revenue potential. Um, and like Taylor was saying, and, and I want to reiterate that because, we, you know, being a property management, we see all the different aspects of vacation rental management come into our, our software. And um, it really is a, an industry where there's a lot of recurring expenses. Um, and it's, it can be at, at times, if you're not careful, a death by a thousand cuts. So you do have to estimate like the taxes and the fees that, that you're going to pay. That's another big one. That's going to come eat into your margins. Um, and then your upfront costs. So you spent all that money on furniture, linen sheets, kitchenware, you need like the decor, even, even if you want to go very minimalist, there's a cost to that. And whether you've taken out a loan for that, or you use your, your upfront money that you had to, to invest in it, you still have to factor that in. And then uh, it's always a question of those recurring expenses. So a big one to also factor in is software. And we'll see a bit later in the presentation how software can help you save money, but there's also an expense to that. Uh, so if you're not careful with the markets you select or even the neighborhood you select, that could start digging into your margins. Um, and then think of all the little things that go into a vacation rental that, that you've experienced and you've enjoyed. So the little things like the soaps and the welcome basket and uh, you know the gifts that you get or whatever, whatever you choose in terms of hospitality, that kicks in. And of course, uh, a big expense and one that's getting more and more challenging to find good, 
good help with. And we're going to get an excellent presenter to talk to us about that. But it's cleaners. Uh, cleaning is a very big fee or a very big expense in, in any vacation rental business. And um, our own data shows that travelers now expect like a very high level of cleanliness in their properties. Experienced vacation rental managers will tell you that, especially since the pandemic. The game has been elevated quite a bit. And so that's a big expense that you'll have to consider. So if we all let Peter talk about cleaners and how to structure uh, a team and, and all that. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Um, so I'm here to talk about a super exciting topic today, uh, which is vacuums. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, seriously, delivering a quality guest experience is mission critical to building and growing a hospitality business, no matter how you decide to acquire your inventory. You know, whether that's arbitrage, equity ownership, or through a revenue share with landlords. Um, and from my time at Airbnb, I know that property cleanliness plays a huge role in guest perception of quality. And the more five star reviews that you can collect from your guests, the more bookings your inventory will drive. So the first thing to focus on is building out a team to complete your routine maintenance and housekeeping tasks. As you can see in my chart on the right, the majority of operators will use at least some outsourced or contract providers as a part of their daily operations. Uh, but as you get started, working with these companies can pay dividends in terms of professionalism, reliability, and cost. But when your business grows, it's going to start to make financial sense to bring on full-time employees. At that point, you can start to be strategic about dispatching your jobs to optimize for both cost, um, but also you know, managing stress uh, and pressure on the team, you know, as requests come in down from guests for early check-ins or late checkouts with tight turnarounds. Um, the challenge, you know, from the on-the-ground perspective, is that you know these assets are all unique and oftentimes spread off, spread out across broad geographic areas. So scheduling and coordinating these tasks is really, really challenging. Um, most operators at this point have moved from pen and paper schedules to digital scheduling tools with as access instructions and embedded checklists. Um, the benefit to doing this from the business perspective is you know, enabling your organization to be a lot more prescriptive with requirements for tasks. You can dynamically update schedules as the needs of guests change, but really importantly, you can document the work that's been completed. Um, you know, oftentimes asset owners will want to know that you're, you know, taking care of their properties. Guests will want to see, you know, what's been done um, prior to their arrival, especially as we continue to navigate through COVID-19. Uh, but this can also be really helpful if there's ever a dispute, you know, with a distribution channel like Airbnb. Um, you know, a guest says, hey, the property was not cleaned when I got there. Um, no more powerful tool than being able to show a nice clean report of, you know, exactly what was done um, and, and, you know, photos to, to back that up. Um, so last but not least, you know, communication is key when it comes to keeping your housekeeping and maintenance operations in line. Unexpected issues happen in the field and your organization has to be quick to respond um, if you're looking to maximize occupancy and revenue. So we know based off of our 2022 property operations survey that about 57% of managers want to reduce manual work by notifying issues to the right staff or department and that 92% of those managers are seeing multiple benefits from clear staff communication. Um, so it is really clear that utilizing a communication tool, be it for external or in, ex, internal or external teams, is going to keep your operations in order and reduce your overhead costs. Please take a look at our website to learn more about property operations and guest communication platform. Uh, our blog is a really, you know, it's a wealth of information with helpful tips and tricks about how to grow your property management business. Um, of course, you'll also be able to learn more about 
you know, our really strong integrations with proper property management systems like Hostfully. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, and Peter touched on a really important point, which was technology and using software to coordinate your tasks and keep your team of cleaners uh, coordinated. Um, maybe one thing we didn't really cover was the the requirement for teams. So in, initially, you might be able to manage your one Airbnb property on your own, for example, and you do the cleaning yourself, and then you're going to like the revenue that that generates uh, because you've done your due diligence, right? And, and you, you understand that. And so you're going to want to expand that to five, six, seven, 10, 20 properties to make a living, maybe income replacement from your job. And so that's where uh, software gets critical. Um, one of the strategies that I invite you to, to read into, we won't have time to discuss it today, is called multi-channel distribution and how that plays in with technology. So I'll give the example of the slide here. You want to list your properties on as many platforms as possible to give them as much visibility and give your chance to increase your nightly rate, knowing that on one platform, it might not perform as best. So in this case, let's say we list our properties on Airbnb, VRBO, and Booking.com. The role of technology here, uh, like a software like Hostfully, but there's competitors out there and they're all very good as well. So you get the reservation that comes in from Airbnb. The software will then uh, take that information and tell VRBO or Verbo and Booking.com and any of the other sites that you're listed on. Some people list up to like six sites. Um, it'll block off the calendar there. Now, if you had one property doing this manually, it would be doable, to be honest. Uh, so you avoid the risk of double bookings, but you could still have an accident, like a, a mishap where let's say you're sleeping and you get one reservation coming in on Airbnb and one coming in on Verbo, and now you have a double booking. And that can lead to, you know, either getting your account uh, penalized on one of the sites if you cancel too many reservations. For sure, you're not gonna get a five-star review from a guest if if you have to like turn them around at the door. So that's the first part of what the software can do. Um, and then uh, your central, like your property management platform, again, hostfully, but it can be a competitor, um, will send the information to Breezeway that a reservation took place or was modified or was canceled. And then Breezeway, like a cleaning app, will take care of assigning the task to the right cleaner and, you know, doing all the functions that they have in their software. And I do invite you to go check them out uh, because a lot of functionality. At the same time, um, because your property management platform coordinates with the calendar, it's communicating with an app like Beyond. Uh, and Ryan hasn't had the chance to talk yet, but a way to increase your revenue is to use dynamic pricing tools. And these essentially look at the market and uh, optimize the pricing so you get the more dollar out of each reservation. But then how can it do that? Well, again, the property management platform will feed the calendar information to Beyond, and then they're gonna send back the optimal pricing, and then your property management platform will then update all those prices on all the websites. And similarly, if you're tracking your analytics to get the most out of your properties, uh, your property management tool will send all that data to a partner like key data uh, for for them to run all their analytics and and uh, all the reports that you can generate from there so this is what you'll hear uh, property managers talk about and if you're like a conference and and you know you have drinks everybody talks about their tech stack what's in their tech stack what tools you use and and depending on the business and how you grow your business um, your tech stack might evolve in a certain way because the beauty with the vacation rental software out there right now is that it's kind of plug and play with integrations. So you could use Hostfully and Breezeway and beyond, or like another property manager might just use Hostfully and beyond because their cleaning requirements are different, right? Um, and so it's always like a little different, but at the end of the day, what vacation rental software does, uh, all the software is, the goal is to reduce time uh, spent on manual and repetitive tasks and also avoid any mistakes, right? Uh, you're using the power of, of, of a software to handle all these little tasks. So that's one example. And I hope 
it uh, explains the flow of how the information goes from all the different apps. Um, typically in an, air, in an arbitrage business, you're gonna want to utilize different types of software to maximize uh, the performance of your properties. So obviously we've got cleaning apps to coordinate all the, the cleaners. Um, and another thing that you might wanna look into uh, before you get started in the arbitrage business, sorry, I have my pet, um, is direct bookings. Um, so it's great to list on all the sites, but if you can be independent from them and save on those fees, going with direct bookings is the way to go. And there's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole field. And we have webinars out there that have been recorded and you can consult them, but essentially uh, there's software that allows you to put a calendar on your site. So you, the people visiting your site can book that reservation. Also, you want to capture their credit card information like Stripe or PayPal so they can pay. So that's for the direct booking site. Again, we talked about data and al analytics, and then there's the whole guest experience aspect uh, that software can help you with. So everything from digital guidebooks uh, for recommendations and uh, upselling products and services. There's software out there that blocks the uh, Wi-Fi so that when the guest tries to log in, they have to put in their email and then you can use that email to try and get referrals or like repeat bookings through direct bookings. And again, you avoid uh, paying the fees to the listing sites and the OTAs and then smart locks. So you can use smart technology to create like a new pin code for your doors for each reservation. So again, you're going to need a centralization tool for that and noise monitoring, uh, insurance and guest vetting. And then of course, dynamic pricing. So as you're planning out your arbitrage business, think of all the software that you can deploy uh, to make your life easier. And there's a lot of research that goes into this as well. And there's a lot of really good tools out there for that. Um, now, since I talked a bit about pricing and I know I got everybody interested in maximizing their uh, revenue potential for their properties, I'm gonna let, give the floor to Ryan, oops, sorry, who's gonna talk about uh, dynamic pricing. Course. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks, Fred. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about pricing and revenue and specifically dynamic pricing and revenue management. Um, and I always like to start just by giving an overview of, of sort of what we've seen industry wise over um, the past, I don't know, 50 to 70 years. Um, you know, you can think of vacation rentals as sort of existing for a lot longer than just Airbnb or booking.com or VRBO. Um, there's always been sort of the, the old school management mentality of, you know, people have always been traveling to maybe more remote destinations in the world, um, been booking and staying, and there are people um, managing those rentals there. Um, I think a lot of the, the industry knowledge has expanded with, um, you know, the rise of the internet. Um, in the 2000s and also with the rise of online travel agencies. Um, so that brought the industry up to an interesting distribution point of view and also just brought uh, a lot of notoriety within the travel industry with names like Airbnb and VRBO. Um, and then now we're sort of in this era where as a property manager or as a homeowner or a host, you have a lot of data and insights and tools available at your disposal. Um, so there's a, there's a lot out there to use to maximize your business and really optimize revenues. Um, but how do you go about doing that? And to Fred's point earlier, I think expanding your, uh, your management with your tech stack is super important um, early on in uh, starting your business because if you're just managing everything inside of Airbnb or inside of VRBO, you're sort of at the mercy of what those tools and those online travel agencies want you to do. Um, and that especially is true from the pricing standpoint. If you're using something like smart pricing, well, Airbnb is pretty much incentivized to get your listing to 100% occupancy no matter what, because that's how they're going to ultimately get their fees. Um, whereas, you know, if you're looking at a couple of different channels and managing your own pricing strategy, you're looking at, yes, a combination of maximized occupancy, but also maximizing that rate depending on the time of the year. So um, just want to start there and give a little overview. But um, this also is sort of what I would call older school uh, pricing. So here we're looking at uh, 365 on this pricing chart for day-by-day um, -day prices. So you can see here, there's a couple different pricing strategies at play, uh, but a lot of these really aren't dynamic. Here you can see the, the host is really assuming, okay, I know when low season is, it's gonna be between September and then up until Thanksgiving, and then maybe uh, kind of before the summer, that's when I'm gonna dip my prices a little bit low, but um, it's pretty basic. It's the same price at you know $150 every single day in low season, 
Same thing for high season. Summer, they know, is best in their market. Um, they probably just have a sense of seasonality. So they increase their prices automatically on July 1st, um, you know, by, by $150. And then same thing with events. Um, you can see Thanksgiving, Christmas, 4th of July. Um, they're increasing there, but it's, it's still pretty basic. So this is what we saw in the industry um, early on. Uh, and Beyond started back in 2014 to sort of take this pricing to the next level. Um, and really mimic what hotels and airlines are doing with their pricing that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. So when looking at some of the data um, that's available in key data and that Taylor spoke to earlier is, you know, markets are super, super dynamic day by day and your prices should reflect that. So in this chart, for example, um, this is internal data that we have at Beyond that we use um, in our pricing algorithm for a U.S. market. And you can see uh, historical occupancy in the blue there shows you, yes, high season is definitely in the summer. You can see some low season dips. We've got um, occupancy spikes for Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, spring break, and then a little bit um, in the summer for 4th of July. So that's really important to consider. And then we also have forward looking occupancy on the black line there. So you can see heading into the next year, what's already on the books, what's already shaping up in this market um, and how some dynamics could be changing year over year uh, just based on dates. But the biggest thing to take away here is that every single day comes with different levels of occupancy and different levels of demand. So if you have those flat prices, you're likely missing out day by day on optimizing your pricing strategy and really maximizing ADR and therefore revenue. So this is an example of what your pricing strategy should look like. We have it overlaid with that manual static pricing strategy. But you can see here, we've really got a day by day strategy here that's taking into account the seasonality in this market, the different factors on day of week demand. So most markets, you're going to assume that people want to travel on weekdays or weekends versus weekdays just because of work and schedules and things like that. And then you can also see some holiday increases here. So that Thanksgiving and Christmas pricing and then also some in the summer. This is sort of blending that market occupancy and demand data and really matching your pricing strategy with um, your, your travelers or your guests willingness to pay as well. So this chart can kind of seem like a lot. To break this down a little bit further, I always like to show a calendar view. So here's an example property that we're pricing uh, for upcoming here in May of 2022. And you can see how we get those different prices every single day. So we really call out three main factors here, starting with the base price. Um, the base price is really just the assigned value that we have for each listing. So we understand that compared to hotels and airlines, vacation rentals and short-term rentals are completely different and unique across the board. Um, how do you price a property that has a hot tub and is next to the beach versus the property that isn't next to the beach and doesn't have a hot tub? Um, we look at ADR values and what guests have paid in the past to really come up with this base price. And then from there, we factor in seasonality. Again, you know high season is in summer maybe, uh, you know, low season is uh, towards the, the end of the fall. Um, so we fact that it at a pricing level and um, work that into the calculation. Same thing with day of week. You can see here in this example for May 30th, um, we're actually pricing it. We're taking the pricing down because that's a Monday. And we know in this market, people are less likely to travel on a Monday. And ultimately, there's more properties available for guests to book, therefore more competition for you on this particular day. Um, then we followed up with an event factor. Um, and when I say event factor, I don't want you to think about an event that you know about or an event that's maybe an in-person conference or festival or something. Think about an event as a, an unnatural short-term change in demand and mostly an increase. So here we have Memorial Day. We know it's going to happen every single year. We know the dates and all that, um, but we can sort of see changes in how the market is uh, performing year over year for events and really trigger pricing increases way ahead of time. If let's say the Super Bowl is announced and people start booking, or there's an eclipse that is uh, announced on a specific date for your market, and all of a sudden people are booking up for some reason that you might not know, that's an event that we want to call out and increase our prices for. And then finally here, we have those three main factors that come into pricing, but it's really, really important to not price completely on historical data. I think the past two, two and a half years kind of taught everybody that things change really quickly. So it's important to have a tool that's also going to look at year over year and also forward looking demand for your market and also factor in increases or decreases to your pricing. Here you can see we're actually increasing the pricing here because the market is performing a little bit better than last year across all of these three factors. So this is what you want to look for when it comes to a pricing strategy as a bare minimum. Um, and again, all of this is to get you out of that manual pricing strategy or get you out of something like smart pricing that isn't as advanced. 
um, but it's not meant to add more work to your plate. It's a different way to price your listings, um, but it's a, it's more uh, advanced and it's more efficient uh, as a way to, to sort of level up your pricing. Now, I always like to finish and call out when we talk about dynamic pricing, we are talking about revenue management, but there's a lot more that comes into play when it comes to revenue management. Um, here are some things listed here that, that really should come to mind when you think about revenue management. I think about revenue management as that larger umbrella that a lot of tools and strategies sort of fall into. Um, things like reviews, uh, your marketing strategy, pricing is obviously a big one. I call that sort of the foundation. Um, we spoke about distribution earlier. That's a big one. Um, you can get your pricing right, but if you're not on the right channels or on enough channels like Airbnb, VRBO, maybe you're on direct booking website, you're ultimately not reaching certain audiences that could lift up your revenue. Um, and then same thing with content. So photos, um, even text content across different platforms can have a really big impact on your overall revenue and should be factored into your revenue management strategy. So if you're struggling with a property pricing wise, and you decrease pricing quite a bit, I encourage you to take a look at other factors that might impact uh, a guest's ability to, to book that actual listing. Go through the process like a guest would find your listing and actually book it and see if you notice anything that you could change. Even if it's not wrong, just make changes and see if that helps, whether it's switching up photos, um, addressing reviews, anything that might help um, ultimately get more guests to book. We found that most people book on pricing, but there are other factors that come into play um, for someone to actually pull the trigger and book your property. Um, so that's everything I have on revenue management and dynamic pricing. Um, excited to share all of that and uh, feel free to add any questions to the chat if you have any. So I'll pass it back to you, Fred. Thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate that. Yeah, revenue management's a really important part or else you're leaving money on the table and uh, using software is a great way to automate that and take advantage of really powerful algorithms. Um, so today, look, we talked about general business, uh, how you should think of your business, how to perform your market research, um, how to structure, like why you should get cleaners and how to structure that and how to organize them. Looked a little bit at software and we looked at uh, revenue management. So in this, if, if you're new to the vacation rental industry, that's fine. Um, there's a lot of really good content out there. Uh, all the partners up here have amazing blogs um, and you know they also have downloadable pdfs ebooks studies market research that they perform so i invite you to you know if you want to rewatch this webinar we are recording it um, and if you, if you want to rewatch it and then you hear a term you're not familiar with uh, just check it out online or you know you can contact us on our websites uh, if you want to contact hostfully for any question it's hello at hostfully.com but I do invite you to take the time to really deep dive in all of this before you go signing a lease with, with uh, a landlord um, and, and, and starting your arbitrage business. Because the more research you do up front, the more you're going to be set up for success. And if you start your business off with the right software, uh, it's just going to create this really solid foundation for you to uh, expand and grow. So this was part one where we did uh, kind of like an overview and the foundations you would need for an arbitrage business. We're gonna have a part two. It's not announced yet, um, or it's, it's not scheduled yet, I'm sorry, but we are announcing it, of course, in this webinar. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more about marketing, uh, marketing your listings, listing optimization, like what to include in those uh, paid ads, social media and direct bookings. Because like we say, it's always good to uh, secure your own bookings. Uh, you save on fees, but you're also a little more independent from uh, websites like Airbnb and VRBO. And kind of like how to think of your business long term. Uh, and then, of course, as you grow and hopefully you become successful in your arbitrage business, the, the type of people you'll need to bring in into your team because it'll quickly, it can quickly become overwhelming. Uh, what, even if you use software, like everybody would like to you know save on on costs like a team but you will need a team to, to help to help you grow so stay tuned uh we're going to announce the date shortly as well as the partners that are going to be on that on that webinar um and i guess we can switch to the question period uh, so if anybody has questions please use the question feature in our tool um 
I'm looking at questions here. And I guess one question that I, I've had was, and we can go kind of like a panel, uh, if Peter would like to start first, it would be what are the what are the pitfalls uh, that someone in the arbit starting an arbitrage business might fall into? So if you could just give us one thing that you could, uh, one nugget of advice, Peter, and then we, we'll go Ryan, Taylor, and then I'll give one myself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest risk with the arbitrage model is the cold, you know, the fact that it's sort of like a cold start. Um, you know, in other words, you, you either need a book of, uh, travelers who know you as a property management company and come back to you year after year um, to rebook your rentals. And so you can you know, load up the calendar with reservations from that group. Um, but on, you know, Airbnb, VRBO, booking.com, all the different distribution channels, you know, as Ryan mentioned, price is definitely a key component uh, in the decision-making purchase. But, you know, second is probably photos, and then a quick third to get people over the finish line is reviews. Um, and so securing a large portfolio of, of leases with no uh, review equity on Airbnb, as I like to say, or any of the other channels uh, can be a little bit of a dangerous proposition. So I'd say that's you know the biggest hurdle is you know filling up that calendar with bookings. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that. And I'd also say if, if you're looking to scale too, which I think most people would be, that can kind of be the, the first thing, first roadblock that you hit. I mean, managing one, two, even three properties can be easy to do on your own. But um, I think most people find that you sort of unlock different efficiencies as you use maybe more technology or even on your own, just come up with processes and sort of build that base. Um, so that's typically what, what we hear as far as the initial roadblocks uh, to limit you past those first couple listings. But there are a ton of resources out there. There are a ton of people talking about this right now. So um, definitely just be on the lookout for more tools um, and strategies that you can use to, to really help scale. Uh, if, you're, if you're planning for that, um, just prepare for it and, and get ready because that is uh, the initial roadblock that we typically see. Um, and I would say a roadblock definitely being the different types of um, requirements in different areas. Some people kind of get ahead of themselves and, and get so excited and have that lease for that specific area. And then it, they've been working on some type of block going on in their market. I know a lot of piece of people like Brent Responsibly have been helping with that um, and helping you keep up to date on any type of requirements that are happening in your area. Um, and so you could book something like I'm in Panama City Beach, I could have an apartment over there. And the next thing I know, there's a, now a requirement on what a rental actually is. Um, but it's been in the pipeline for a while. It just never actually was officially announced. So just making sure that you're up to date on that too. And I'll, I'll wrap up with the, uh, just to share something about myself, I'm more of a conservative investor. So starting out in Airbnb arbitrage, um, for me personally, I would say uh, as much due diligence as you can. and there's really great tools to assess revenue and uh, leases and things like that. But also like a key component is regulation. So in our industry, we're, we're very vulnerable to uh, local politicians and regulations. And there's a good reason for that. Some locals feel that uh, the vacation rental business might take away from affordable housing. And we're not going to get into that debate today. However, uh, one part of your due diligence should also be what the mood of the neighborhood or of your city or even your state or your province is uh, with regards to upcoming regulations on short-term rentals because the last thing you would want to do is get involved in, in a long-term lease with someone and then you know a month down the road it gets shut down and you can usually catch that kind of information um, obviously in your local papers, but also like in your town hall, like they have minutes of meetings and whether they deliberated that, uh, the politicians did. So that's that would be a big part of your due diligence. Um, and then we talked about something and this is more advanced, but uh, if you are starting in the arbitrage business, um, just be mindful of like maybe uh, supporting some of our uh, lobbyists, I suppose we could call them, but there's a lot of organizations out there that are putting a really good word out for short-term rentals and they accept donations. And they're the ones that, you know, argue on our behalf uh, with local politicians. So 
definitely visit their websites as well. Uh, Rent Responsibly is one that I can think of right now. And if you can, and if you're successful with your arbitrage business, donate because they're the ones that are putting out a good word for us in our industry. Um, so one question we have here is, uh, how can you list on multiple sites without paying fees? So I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer that one. So if you're listing on sites like Airbnb and VRBOwnBooking.com, you're always going to have to pay some sort of fee uh, back to them. And that's, it's unfortunate to share your profits with them. However, they do provide a very valuable service. So they uh, put out a tremendous amount of marketing. Uh, they grow the industry because for every guest that uh, they pull away from the traditional hotel industry into a vacation rental, you know, so they're responsible for growing an industry and offering those really good platforms. So th they, there is value in paying a fee to them um, and then all the reservations that they bring in. However, a big trend uh, lately with vacation rental managers has been to uh, bring back or secure some direct bookings in their business. So people strive for like 100% direct bookings. You maybe don't need to like go that far, but try and like uh, get some direct bookings and you do that with creating your own website or getting someone to create it or there's software out there that creates it for you and then uh, whenever you get guests that come into your rentals either airbnb or vrbo or whatever site you get them from uh, try and get them engaged with either your social media handles or uh, try and get their email somehow so that you can then offer them deals like a discount if they come back next year or something like that. So there's a lot of different strategies and those that are interested in direct booking sites, again, I, like this is a whole webinar in its own, but uh, really good content out there. You can visit hostfully.com. We've got a lot of uh, good stuff out there, including eBooks for you. Um, and then with regards to getting emails, we had another question for capturing emails when guests log into Wi-Fi. So I believe the company is called uh, StayFi and uh, essentially it's just a little portal uh, when the guest logs in, kind of like when you're at the airport and you have to put your email in there. So it's the same idea. And then uh, that's one way that you can build out your email list to get repeat bookings. Um, sorry to plug our product, but the Hostfully Digital Guidebooks uh, they also have the option of adding a little splash screen and a terms of use for the rental. And then once they sign, they have to sign it with their email. And so before they can access like the local recommendations and how to do check-in and all those things, they put in their email that way. And then that's another way for you to capture that email. Um, someone had a question about revenue share with the landlord. I don't know if anyone on the panel has any experience with that. It can, it can vary um, based on what I've seen. Again, like if you want to do revenue share with your landlord, that's a number you're going to have to negotiate with him or her. Um, yeah, I mean, just to jump in here, Fred, you know, I think we see commission rates vary from market to market. This is really more of the more traditional vacation rental model. I think in urban destinations, we're starting to see it more pop up more and more within multifamily units. Uh, those asset owners want uh, the upside exposure to short term rentals, but not the cost. Um, you know, on average, I think, um, you know, commission rates range from probably like 20 to 10 percent, uh, somewhere in the middle. And, you know, you'd, you'd have to negotiate one off with a landlord to figure out exactly what you could get. Great. Thanks, Peter. So another question was, <clears throat> where can I start looking for subletting properties? So that's going to depend on your market. Uh, Taylor uh, pointed out to like Zillow. Uh, of course, you can look at your local paper anywhere where you would find um, just basically an apartment for rent. You could start that way. And then before approaching a landlord, this is where having a software provider like Key Data to check if it's even worth it before starting to negotiate a lease with a landlord uh, can really be worth it. I know, Taylor, did you want to add anything? I did, yeah, and I actually saw someone else ask kind of how accurate is key data and is it something that 
if you just have one arbitrage versus having more STR properties, if it's worth it. And yes, so we do actually have a smaller dashboard that'll work where you can be able to see your market and really make sure, or the market you're looking at, just have access to that data. Um, so definitely have that direct source data for certain markets. And it does depend on the market that you're looking in. The data is based on um, the amount of direct source uh, data sources we have there. So um, definitely something we can talk about though. If you guys, anyone's interested in going to key data to ask for more questions, you can go right on our website and find more information there. Excellent. And a couple more questions. Is there a system to automate reviews for guests who have just stayed in the unit? So um, there's third-party software you could implement within your property management platform. Uh, higher tier property management platforms, again, like Hostfully, but some of our competitors also do this, have a system where you can upload templates. And basically, once your cleaners, like they'll communicate back through Breezeway, for example, and they'll say, okay, everything's good. There's been no damage. You know, the place isn't gross or anything. Um, then you could just hit one of your templates and it's going to upload um, the, the review on Airbnb, for example. So you can you can automate that or semi-automate it. Um, is 50% revenue share fair with no lease? <laughs> I guess that's a very pointed question. Um, I think it depends on, on your potential revenue. Uh, but if ultimately, you're going to have to factor that in when you do your market research. So if you feel it's fair and it's a good deal, then absolutely go for it. Uh, I don't know if any of our partners have an opinion on sharing 50% of your revenue. The, the challenge, like the only thing I would warn with 50%, and it's a fairly high number, is um, if you're doing profit share or revenue share, you're entering into vacation rental management territory. Um, so I would just say like, typically you're gonna see rates of like 20 to 30%. So maybe you're paying a little too much revenue share, but it all depends because there's no lease uh, and, and the business model you're doing. But I, I personally, I would say it's a little st stiff. But Yeah, I think it might be tough to find a asset owner who's willing to jump into that one. Um, but. Hey, maybe I got one for Ryan on the revenue management side. If I'm an operator, you know, what occupancy level should I be targeting if I'm really looking to maximize my profit? Yeah, so it'll depend on what's going on in the market. I mean, it's not realistic to hit 100% occupancy if the market's only at 10%. So ideally, it's sort of staying in line with, with seasonally what's going on. I will say um, my background initially is in hotel revenue management, and the goal there is really to sell 100% of your occupancy. Um, we are dealing with perishable inventory. You can't sell last night again if you didn't sell it. Just go back up on the shelf. So maximizing occupancy towards 100% is always the goal. But um, you know, if you're decreasing rate uh, to a point where you're now losing money on a rental, um, then that's obviously not ideal. So finding that sweet spot between your minimum and then also the, the market uh, level occupancy um, by having tools like key data to get that insight is sort of um, where you're going to find the sweet spot, depending on the market that you're in. If you're in a city in a more urban market, you're going to see more steady uh, demand throughout the entire year. But if you're in um, more of a, a coastal or drive to rural market, you're going to see those big seasonal fluctuations just depending um, on the market dynamics. So I would check there and, and sort of align yourself with the market to start. Yeah, pretty interesting. I mean, because if I'm at 100% occupancy, wouldn't you say I have a problem with my pricing? Depends on if you're filling up at the last minute or not. So uh, then we can factor in your booking window, how far in advance people are, are booking listings in, in your area or booking listings in your portfolio. Um, so yeah, if you're booking up 100%, you know, 30, 40, 50 days out, you're probably underpriced and people are taking advantage of that. Um, so as long as you're maintaining sort of the, the average rate alongside the market, that's sort of the, the key up until you get to that actual date. Because mm -hmm. if I fill to 100% in the last couple of days, that's all gravy and taking care of the perishability problem. Super interesting. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, we're nearing the hour. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone, for the great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to every single one of them. However, um, you can reach out to any of us or any of our companies. Uh, again, hostfully, today we have Breezeway, Beyond, and Key Data. And uh, just go on their website, 
most of us have chat chat options. You can even email us. Uh, so please, if you have questions about arbitrage and how to get set up, don't hesitate to ask questions. We're here to help. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the second part of the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, this has been really great. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.